Don Patton is here to introduce our speaker, and uh, I'm sure you'll remind us of tomorrow evening. I will. <laughs> well, I wanted to uh, express the appreciation of the World War II Roundtable for your support of our organization in uh, monetary and also in attendance. Uh, but yes, we have a program tomorrow night. Uh, the topic is the Battle of Britain. Uh, we have a speaker, and I've actually got to leave to go pick him up at the airport, Dr. Robin Hyam, who was an RAF pilot. He, uh, uh, 42 to 46, I think it was. He flew C-47s in China, Burma. He wasn't in the Battle of Britain, but he's written extensively uh, as a part of his British heritage. Uh, we have another speaker who is uh, going to speak to you momentarily, Dr. Roy Heidegger, who is the historian for the 4th Fighter Wing, down at Seymour Johnson. Uh, he is the historian for the Eagle Squadron. The Eagle Squadron were the Americans, and I think all other, a lot of other nationalities, that went to England before our involvement, uh, flew Spitfires and probably hurricanes also, he can answer those questions tomorrow night. But uh, the, uh, uh, we had a Minnesotan that was in that. His name was Arthur Donahue from St. Charles, Minnesota. And uh, Doc will, uh, will talk about him and the RAF in the Battle of Britain uh, tomorrow night. Today, he's going to talk about the 4th Fighter Group. He, uh, Fighter Wing, I'm sorry. We're talking about 4th Fighter Group from World War II forward. And uh, he is uh, from New York. Got his, uh, got a degree from uh, Marquette. When I first connected with him, probably 25 years ago. Uh, he then went out to California, got his master's PhD. And again, he's been at Seymour Johnson uh, for the last uh, uh, most of a decade. So I'd like for you to welcome Dr. Roy Heidegger, Fourth Fighter Group World War II to today. okay with you all. I'm going to focus more on the World War II stuff. A uh, little bit about what's happened since then, but mostly on the World War II stuff. Um, if you've noticed, we put a couple of art prints over on the side there. My wife owns an art dealership and she also publishes art. Uh, brought a couple of things that uh, she has published that she normally sells for 85 bucks. And when I told her I was coming here, I said, can I, can I bring some? And she said, fine. And I said, can I sell some? And she said, fine. And if anybody's interested, we've got a handful, and you can have them for 25 So if you see something you like, just give a shout, and, and we'll, let, uh, we'll let you have it. Also, if my ride agrees, um, when we're done, there's uh, some people I'd love to interview, because I have a radio show back home also, and every morning at 6.45 a.m., while people are brushing their teeth, they get to listen to me talking to either people from Seymour Johnson or people who I've come across when I've deployed. Um, I spent the first part of this year in Kyrgyzstan, north of Afghanistan, with the 376 Air Expeditionary Wing supporting the fight in Afghanistan. I am an emergency essential civilian, so part of my job is about every two years the Air Force says, guess where you're going? And I deploy to wherever they want me to go, and I'm, I'm very proud of that. I turned 60 while I was over there. I'm fairly disabled, uh, artificial knees, diabetes, et cetera, et cetera. But, uh, I'm in the fight, and um, I've got to talk them into letting me go, but as long as they let me go, I'm going. And the reason is the men and women who are in our service today have been at war for 20 years, and they are amazing. They are the best of who we are, and to serve alongside of them has been the great privilege of my life. So it's, it's such an honor to do that. I, I respect and love all our veterans. 
Um, special place in my heart for the World War II folks, but a real special place in my heart for the people who are in the fight today. It's hard to imagine. Uh, World War II, the whole country went to war. People went off to war, fought the war, won the war, and came home. These folks have been doing it for 20 years, back and forth, back and forth, trying to raise a family, trying to raise their kids. Um, extraordinary. Plus, when I was over in Kyrgyzstan, when I would meet people or when I would interview people, I'd always have to ask them, what are you? Are you active duty Air Force? Are you reserve? Are you guard? Because everybody's in the fight, and it takes everybody to make it to make it work. So uh, just I, I can't I can't say enough what a privilege that was. And uh, if they let me go again, I'm I'm absolutely absolutely going again. Say, Don, one sir. Second. I also forgot to tell the group he runs a round table in Goldsboro, mm -hmm. uh, North Carolina. So. Uh, it's not all World War II. It's, it's military history, and what we're doing now is we're doing the 150th anniversary of the Civil War. So I recently did the third day at Gettysburg. Um, next Tuesday, uh, we're doing Chickamauga. But next week, I'm actually going to be in Dayton, Ohio, for the reunion of the four fighter interceptor wing guys, the guys from Korea. So first time I get to be with them, I'm going to interview all of them. And uh, in October, I'm scheduled to be with the 376th Heavy Bombardment Group, B-24 Ploesti guys. So uh, every opportunity I get to be with World War II folks and interview them is, is just absolutely my pleasure. Um, fourth Fighter Group, well, like, like Don was saying, Eagle Squadrons, World War II, 245 Americans who are living relatively good life at home. We're not at war. So they're going to school, working, whatever they're doing, but they had to go. They had to go fight for England, and they did. So three Eagle Squadrons, 71, 121, 133. 71 in particular was a great fighter squadron. There was a time in which they had more kills during certain months than any other Royal Air Force squadron. So our guys really contributed. Well, Pearl Harbor happens. And uh, 8th Air Force gears up in Europe, so what are we going to do with these guys? Well, the uh, United States at first said, well, we'll take them and we'll shift them as sort of the foundation of fighter squadrons all across Europe. And um, our guys said, ain't going to happen. We want to stay together. So the, the Royal Air Force squadrons became the 4th Fighter Group. 71 becomes 334 Squadron, 121 becomes 335 Squadron, 133 becomes 336 Squadron. So we have a cadre, a foundation of experienced fighter pilots to get us going into the war. Um, brief overview, uh, and then I just want to tell you some quick stories about some of the amazing people that served in the 4th Fighter Wing. Um, started off flying the same Spitfires they flew in the Eagle Squadrons, put stars on them, and then they transitioned to the P-47 Thunderbolt. Now, I understand some of you guys flew the P-47? Yes? No? Maybe? Well, P-47 was a great plane. It's only one problem. It's about three times as big as a Spitfire. So you go from flying this small, fast, maneuverable sports car to this big truck, and our guys didn't like it. So uh, Don Blakesley, who I'm going to be talking about, um, wing commander, goes to the head of 8th Air Force fighters and says, we got to have the Mustang. And he goes, Colonel, I'd love to give you the Mustang, but I can't pull you guys out of the fight. Well, Blakesley said, you give me 24 hours and we'll be in battle. And the guys came back from a mission with the P-47s and lined up along the runway are all those brand spanking new P-51s. 24 hours, they're in combat. And some of the guys, their first flight in the P-51 is on the way to Europe in their, in their first combat mission. So he made it happen. Once we got the P-51, the numbers just went crazy. Uh, Blakesley's attitude was, we're here to kill Germans. If you're not here to go up every chance you get and shoot down every plane you can, what are you doing here? So the numbers just started to go. Towards the end of the war, the 4th Fighter Group and the 56th Fighter Group, P-47 Group, were kind of neck and neck as far as who's going to have the most kills. April 16, 1945, war is almost over. 
one day, the fourth fighter group destroys 105 German planes. So that puts them over the top. 1,016 destroyed were the most destroyed by any group or wing in history that will never, that, that record will never be broken. But uh, let me talk to you about some of the guys, because to me, that's what makes it special, is the people. The people who were there, the people who did this. Uh, Steve Pisanos, born in Greece, little kid, sees a Greek jet uh, airplane fighter fly overhead, goes, oh boy, do I want to do that. Well, he sneaks onto the base and he's, you know, sweeping out the hangars and get to know everybody. And one day somebody says, kid, what are you, what are you doing? He goes, well, I'm going to join the Greek Air Force when I get older. He's like, you can't, because that was a class system. If you weren't in the nobility, you didn't get to do it. He was nobody. Well, 18 years old, gets a job on a Greek freighter. When it docks in Baltimore, he jumps ship, goes to New York, gets a job in a restaurant. Every spare penny he makes takes flying lessons, and then he hears about the Eagle Squadrons forming up. You know, go to Canada, go to England, become an RAF pilot. He does it. Finishes the war at ace, winds up being the uh, air attache to the Greek embassy. Everybody in Greece knows who this guy is because he was so famous. He was such a great success story. He's still alive and uh, spoken to a couple of times. Had some school kids come over from England who wanted to do a project on the Eagle Squadrons. Got a conversation going with the kids and, uh, and Colonel Pisano. So he's an example, the kind of guy. Another example, a guy called Kid Hofer, athlete, boxer, football player, outdoorsman. He's going into Canada, hasn't heard about the Eagle Squadrons, doesn't know anything about flying. Mm -hmm. Crosses the border, and the Canadian official goes, oh, young man, you're, you're here to join the Eagle Squadrons. And he goes, what's that? Well, you know, fighting the Germans, flying Spitfires, the whole bit. Hofer goes, really? Where do I go? So he does. He becomes he becomes a uh, uh, Eagle Squadron pilot. Becomes a fourth fighter group pilot. The biography of him is called the last of the screwball aces, because he was he was just crazy. He would take his German Shepherd up in the air with him, fly alongside another American plane, and he ducked in. <laughs> so they look over and they see the, the German Shepherd flying the plane. <laughs> and this guy, you know, he didn't want to hear anything about escorting bombers. He was there to kill Germans. So every chance he got, he was off by himself. And I'm going to tell you about a guy later who was unfortunately with him when he was off by himself. But uh, he didn't make it. He uh, didn't survive the war. One of our top aces, but didn't survive the war. In fact, it's kind of funny. He was shot down in, I want to say, Romania, and for years there was a story that he was shot down by Eric Hartman, who's the ace of aces, 352 kills. And it's like, that was a badge of honor. It's like, well, we lost the kid, but Eric Hartman got him. So that kind of made it okay. Um, John Godfrey went over to uh, fly for, for the Royal Air Force. Kind of a, uh, you know, not a serious guy. His family wanted him to go to school, but he didn't want to do that. Then his brother was killed trying to get to Europe on a ship sunk by a German U boat, Reggie. So he named his plane Reggie's Reply, and he became another one of our top scoring aces. He teamed with Don Gentili, and they formed the most famous pair of wingmen in the Air Force because they designed a system where they had similar markings on their plane, and they would swap. So depending upon the dogfight, the wingman might become the lead, and vice versa. So he and Gentili did a great job. Gentili was called a one-man Air Force by General Eisenhower. He was the first American to have more kills than uh, the great Eddie Rickenbacker in World War I. There's a fairly current biography of Gentili and Godfrey and it's called Two-Man Air Force, which I think is, is totally cool. When they're still flying P-47s, Gentili's flying a mission, and he's going against FW-190s, and again, he's like the leading scorer over in the European theater. He runs out of ammo, and he's separated from everybody else. 
So our guys are flying in the vicinity, and over the radio they hear, help, help, help. Who is this? You know, it's so-and-so. Well, where are you? I'm down by the railroad tracks. What's going on? I'm getting clobbered. Help. So everybody in the, everybody in the group hears this. And um, one of the things that he says is, if I don't make it back, I got two today. So if I don't make it back, make sure I get the credit. Well, he gets away from the German fighters, makes it back to the base. He comes into the Oak Club, and there's a piano player called Pierce McKinnon, another ace, great pilot, but he plays the piano. Gentilly walks in the room. Everybody sees it's Gentilly, and the room goes quiet. And McKinnon starts playing the piano, and in unison, they go, help, 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 I'm getting clobbered down here by the railroad tracks. Help, 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 I'm getting clobbered. Tell them I got two, if I don't do that. <laughs> Broke them all up. Now, McKinnon, in addition to being a piano player and a great, he winds up being one of the squadron commanders by the end of the war. One of the great stories about McKinnon is 8th Air Force orders work. No way, if Somebody gets shot down, are you allowed to go get him? Because you're flying a little tiny airplane that could barely hold one guy. Well, McKinnon gets shot down over France. And he's, you know, they can see he's on the ground. He, you know, he looks safe. He actually crash landed, so he still had to shoot. His wingman, Lieutenant Green, is like, the heck with this, I like this guy. He lands. They throw away both their chutes. McKinnon sits on, sits on Green's lap, and they make it back to England, despite the fact that the guy flying the plane can't see a damn thing. So the guy, the kid is telling him where to go and what to do, and he's flying the plane. But I mean, to me, that just shows the band of brother concept of these guys, that somebody would do that, risk his life, and then risk both of their lives, because if they got into trouble over the channel, no shoots. So uh, would have been, would have been tough going. Um, the other gentleman, I had the, the privilege of meeting him, uh, Frank Spear. He was Kid Hofer's wingman. And when they're coming back from a mission, Hofer goes, hey, I'm, I'm, I'm going hunting. I need to get more kills. Spear's got no choice but to follow him. Well, Hofer decides to strafe a German airfield. Well, that was more dangerous than aerial combat. We lost most of our good guys strafing because the Germans had all the flag towers. Well, as Spear always, always used to tell people, you didn't want to be the wingman when you're strafing because the German gunners wouldn't get the lead plane, they get the wingman. So Spear gets shot down. He spends almost a year as a German POW. They had a system where the Germans would come into the barracks and do a count. So there would be like a, a senior enlisted man and a private. And they'd go around in a circle, and they'd count off, I'd spy, try, you know, to get it. And they'd be at different parts of the barracks when they got to the final count. Well, this barracks had 14 prisoners. So they'd go, Svarv, Dreitzein, Fiatzein, and that would be the count. Well, Speer, German name, Frank, spoke a little German. So the guard would go, Dreitzein, Fiatzein, and Frank would go, don't say and the, and the guy in charge would go nuts because he knew there were only 14. So he's screaming at that guy, calling him every, everything in German you could ever call him. And of course, the Americans are trying to not laugh because they know what's going on. So they do it again. And Frank does it again. And the guy goes crazy all over again. They do it a third time, and Frank thinks, better part of valor. I'm done. So, third time. And of course, the, the junior guy is probably looking at the senior guy, guy going, what kind of an idiot are you? Obviously, there's something going on, and you're too stupid to figure it out. Um, we got Frank to the base a couple of years ago, total rock star, and we lost him within about six months. But it was so great that we could get him to the base and have him rub elbows with the modern 334 squadron. They just <coughs> hung on his every word. It was, it was absolutely amazing. Um, another recent kind of experience that we had, during World War II, 
we had an, a uh, crew chief, maintenance guy, called Don Allen. Well, before the war, Don graduated from commercial art school. So he gets drafted, Army Air Corps tests him and says, oh, you've got all this great skill, you can, we're going to make you a uh, crew chief. The guys found out he could paint. So he did 58 separate pieces of nose art on our planes. So he's very, very famous for that. Also during World War II, we flew the Russian shuttle mission. What that was, was normally they'd fly from Devon, escort the bombers, or you know, go on a strafing mission, whatever, and then fly back to Devon. Well, about three weeks after D-Day, they escorted the bombers, they bombed Germany, and they kept going east, and they landed in Russia. Well, in order to make that happen, we had to send maintainers, so the maintainers could maintain the Mustangs. Well, there was a transport plane that took care of most of them, but not enough. Don Allen was a B-20, uh, sorry, B-17 waste gunner. That's how we got there. So he's there, and some of the guys came to him and they said, hey, Don, we can, we can fit you in now. You can go back with us. So he goes to the captain of the B-17, he goes, hey, Skipper, thanks for the ride, but I'm, I'm good, I, can, I need to go back with you. And the pilot looks at him and he goes, uh, excuse me, Sergeant, you're my waist gunner, he ain't going nowhere. So Frank, uh, Don, was the only guy who did the rest of the missions, which was from there they went to Italy, bombing stuff in the Balkans, and then they went back to England, bombing stuff in France on the way. So Don Allen got to do all of that. When I interviewed him, I guess it was 2007, he didn't even talk about that. And I finished the interview, and we're walking back to the main room at the reunion, and somebody said, who'd you talk to? Don Allen. Did he tell you about the Russian shuttle mission? No. And there's Don, like, sir, come on. So I got, to, got him to talk about that. A couple of years ago, um, the uh, civil engineering squadron on the base came to me, and they said, we're building some new streets. We need some names. I put Don Allen on the top of the list. It took the Air Force two years to come back and say, approved. So I called his son. By this time, he was in a nursing home. And I said, it's official. How do you want to do this? So his son called me when the whole family was surrounding his dad in the nursing home. And I got to say, hey, Don, guess what? You know, we normally name streets after generals and aces and pilots, but we are so privileged that we now have a Don Allen street at Seymour Johnson Air Force Base. He cried. We brought him to the base to dedicate the street and had a big ceremony. His whole family came with him. And uh, the maintenance professional, the year banquet was held that, that, uh, that next day. Even though a three star was the guest speaker, Don was the real star. Everybody had to have their picture taken with him, talk to him, it was amazing. We lost him about two weeks ago. And it, it, it's happy, sad. It's, it's sad because a great guy is gone, but it's happy because we're so pleased we could make the very end of his life so special that his family got to see it. I'll never forget his daughter saying to her daughter, you make sure you bring your children to this base and see your grandfather's street. So that was special. Last but not least, Don Blakesley, the great wing commander that I talked to you about. This man flew more air combat than anybody in the United States in World War II. He was always up there. Um, a lot of the, the way he got away with it is he had a, a sergeant follow him around with a clipboard who'd make stuff up. You know, training flight over Berlin. You know, <laughs> that kind of thing. Flew and flew and flew and flew. When Gentili came back from a mission, knowing the press was there to cover him, he did a real hot dog stunt and flew so low, he clipped the bottom of the plane, crashed, destroyed the plane. He was fine. But Blakesley had a rule. You break your kite, they call them kites for the old RAF days, you're going home. So Gentili never served again with the fourth fighter group. Well, Blakesley, uh, in 44, despite all these hours, he's up every mission. And leadership said, we're, we're sitting you down. 
they've had a lot of other guys who were captured by the, the Germans, Hub Zemke, people like that. They're like, the Germans are dying to get their hands on you. We're sitting you down. We're not gonna. We're not gonna let you. Blake Slee came back from a, a mission in which he'd flown real long hours, had been doing it for you know days and days on end. Blake Slee came back to the base and didn't put his landing gear down and broke his kite, sent himself home. I will always be convinced that there was something inside of him that did that on purpose. That's the only way that he could take himself out of the fight, was to do something like that. So he broke his kite, sent himself home. Um, our wing, since then, you know, how do you top that? The Korean War, our guys shot down more MiGs than the entire rest of the Air Force combined. Unbelievable record. Um, served in Vietnam, Desert Storm, Iraqi Freedom, um, one of our squadrons is heading back over to Afghanistan. So, the way that I like to put it, the spirit of the Eagle Squadrons, the spirit of the volunteer, that if there's a fight in, in which good is fighting evil, I gotta be in it. And that's what our, what our guys and gals do today. So, it is a rare privilege for me to be their historian. Um, this was my first assignment in the Air Force, and normally Air Force historians will gravitate to other areas, especially in an effort to move up in the world. I don't need to move up in the world. I've got the best job in the Air Force. So uh, my wife and I are going to be there forever. Privilege speaking to all of you today. Uh, if you have any questions, um, let, me, let me hear them. And also, if there's anybody else that wants to do a quick interview, if that's, if that's OK, um, I'd love to talk to you. So thank you. Questions? Sir? For your background and for these uh, members here, there's a uh, American Eagle guy by the name of Dick Alexander. You're familiar with him? Not all stop my head. Uh, born in uh, Ohio, uh -huh. went to Canada. He was a golden glover, uh -huh. little guy. Mm -hmm. uh, and he uh, gets his first uh, uh, German aircraft uh, uh, in Malta. And then comes the reorganization, and he ends up with uh, 5.5. Uh, and the last one is in the waning days of the war. He was at the right place at the right time over the channel, and he's flying some type of a cap cover. And uh, the radar vectors, which were pretty good then, say, we've got a buzz bomb, uh, and you're in position to take it out if you so choose. And Dick Alexander chose to try to take it off, which means that you had to be at the right place, you had to have the right velocity, the right angle, and he gets down and he does tip it over, which was the big secret to getting a buzz bomb out uh, of circulation. They had a 10 cent gyro, and all you had to do was blow on it, so I'm told, and the buzz bomb would go, and what they wanted was get these things over the channel, so they didn't kill anybody. And it goes on. Uh, stays with the Air Force, but he's flying out of Germany in 1947 uh, in a P-51, and he loses coolant. And everybody knows, I think, uh, or should know, if you lose coolant in the P-51, punch out. Well, you didn't have an injection. He punched out. He hits the stabilizer uh, from about 500 feet. And when he comes to, as he tells the story, he was looking up at a German farmer who didn't get the story. And the farmer who got a pitchfork came right at his throat. Uh, but he makes it, but he loses his arm. Uh, so that's a big story, but there's a sequel to it having to do with a B-17 gunner. You mentioned B-17s and gunners. Uh, I can't remember the year, but we were down at Pier 66 having a meeting, a good place to have a meeting. And of course, being in the sonar business, we went fishing. Now, Dick has only got one arm, but the deal was we were out for sale, uh, the sailfish, and one rod was designated his. Uh, and when Fish On came, Dick was going to go for that and set some type of a record of landing a sail with one arm. <laughs> Fish On, that rod goes down. The B 17 gunner grabs the rod and blows the whole deal. And this little pugilist uh, about blows the B-17 gunner off the back end of the boat. And uh, so 
So in a quick wrap, that's, that tells you a little bit about these guys who were flying these aircraft. He'd still be flying today. I don't know if he's alive or not. You can add that one to your flight log. Who else? Don, do you have a business card or a contact? I do. Absolutely. So, and uh, also, if anybody wants uh, my wife's card, unbelievable website with cool stuff. And again, if you see anything you like, tell her I met you guys here, and she'll uh, she'll take care of you. Any anybody else, sir? What do you do your radio show? Um, I, it's every morning, Monday through Friday, at 6:45 a.m. So I just I just tape it and, and and shoot it to them. Did 124 interviews in Kyrgyzstan that I sent back. And uh, anybody who wants to talk to me, I will also send it, I'll email it to you. So you'll have a record of it and you can share it with uh, friends and family because the likelihood of your hearing it in North Carolina are pretty slim. So uh, if anybody wants to talk to me, I'll, I will also email it to you. So and anybody who wants to have a conversation, I love it. And I, and I think the, the folks back home love it too because this show's been on the air for 57 years. And it's nice to talk to people other than just people from Seymour Johnson to get other stories and other perspectives of people. So, absolutely. How long did Arthur Donahue stay with the Eagles? Mark Donahue was hardly with them at all, because what happened was there were only seven Americans who actually fought with the RAF in the Battle of Britain, Art Donahue being one of them. I guess I should do that, sorry. Um, Art Donahue being one of them. And what happened was they transferred him to 71 Eagle Squadron, 71 Eagle Squadron took forever to stand up. It's like it's official in July of 1940, and a few months later we get some rooster buffaloes, which they never, they, they actually, they wound up destroying them on purpose so they wouldn't have to fly them, and trying to get a cadre of pilots. So Art shows up in the 71, and I think he was, I don't think it was two months, and he said, hey guys, I'm not here to hang around. I need to get back to the fight. So they transferred it back. So he's one of those people who never flew a mission with them, but technically was part of the Eagle Squadrons when they were standing up 71. Oh, great book. Yeah, Yank and the RAF. Uh, I read it recently. And yes, I didn't read the Singapore one. But what's so good about Art's book, not only that he's, you know, he's from uh, Farmingdale. Where is oh, St. Charles. St. Charles. Grew up on a farm. Um, he just tells it like it is. I mean, he's just this guy from Minnesota who's flying for the Royal Air Force and just very detailed what it was like on a day-to-day -day basis. So, great book, and uh, a lot of libraries have it, and uh, not too bad to get your hands on. Anybody? Anybody else? Sir? Uh, the Hunter Bomb Group is having a re reunion down in Savannah, Georgia, about 15 months I am. I'm their banquet speaker. Oh, yeah. Yes. <laughs> well, Jim, you don't have to go. You heard him already. <laughs> busy, busy, busy times. In fact, it's funny because a lot of people don't realize this. When I was in Kyrgyzstan at our weekly staff meeting, that's with all the group commanders, squadron commanders, everybody, I would give a history brief. And before I went overseas, I talked to the guy that was already there who I knew was going to be my boss, and I said, look, I'm a military historian. I said, I'll brief about the 376, but I know you've gotten that over and over and over again. I said, let me, let me talk about anything. And he said, yeah, that'd be great. So I talked about the Doolittle Raid. I talked about the Eagle Squadrons. I talked about you know, the Battle of Agincourt. I mean, I, I covered all kinds of stuff. But I also covered the B-24 guys in World War II. So, it's going to be such a pleasure to talk to those guys in Savannah next month and say, your history, your heritage is alive and well. There's not only a, a wing that bears your markings and your number, but they care about you guys. They care about your heritage. They were B-17s. No, the 376 was B-24. Yeah, but the 100th Brown group was... Oh, okay. But it's what I'm going to is a three, 376. Oh. Yeah. So, I'm not, is the 100 also in Savannah? Yes, right. Yeah, okay. About the middle of October. That might be the week after, because the, my guys are the 9th through the 13th. Oh, yeah. And I think you said the 15th? Yeah, right. Yeah, yeah so that might be right after. The 17th, I think. Yeah, so uh, my wife wouldn't let me stay. Um, I'll just have to do the one group and, and move on. She's, uh, she's a champ for letting me come and do this. So, Any, anybody else? Thank you so much. And again, if you want to, if you want to have a quick chat, uh, 
you know, just um, uh, hang up, hang around. And um, my my job as uh, your interviewer is to make you look good. So uh, if anyone's sitting there thinking, oh, I don't know about this, it's uh, it's a lot of fun. And three four minutes goes like that. So if you're if you're willing, hang tight, and, and we'll do that. And, other than that, thank you so much. It was a pleasure talking to you all today. Thank you.